Hey everyone, it's Colin from GIY Guy. Thanks for checking out today's video. This gardening channel is dedicated to helping you guys grow it yourself. And today we've got a really cool video. Uh, we've got Dr. Charlie Coffey, a professional blackberry grower here in Nashville, Tennessee. He works for Cultivate Farms and I actually have the privilege of getting to record a presentation he gave to some blackberry growers local to the Nashville area. So basically in today's video, it's gonna be an hour long crash course from Charlie about how to start a blackberry farm. Whether you're a single family household that's just growing in your your backyard or if you're growing at a commercial scale on one or multiple acres of land this is going to be a great video it's going to give you a walkthrough of how to start things to look out for kind of developing a plan for your farm and then also we're going to get into some lessons learned some tips and tricks takeaways uh, that he's got for us from the last uh, I think seven years he's been growing blackberries so he's got a lot of experience uh, he's got a good network of blackberry farmers that he works with here in Nashville so they kind of combine all of their uh, all their knowledge they've got, and he's gonna share that with us today. So without further ado, I'm gonna sit back and enjoy the presentation myself. Uh, feel free, if you've got questions throughout this video, throw them in the comments below. I'll send an email to Charlie, and I'm sure between uh, the handful of us that like to grow blackberries, we'll get an answer to you. Uh, but with that, keep growing yourself, and I'll catch you in the next one. We have Colin with us this morning. Colin is a volunteer from Church of the City, and uh, has asked to videotape this so I told him he gets what he gets so uh, I'm not going to worry about him nor the videography part of it so I'm just going to do my regular classroom lecture. Uh, as I told you before there are six P's in gardening and we're going to do the six P's of gardening so here they are. It's fixing to get ready that's the purpose of a garden. The second thing is getting ready that's the preparation or the planning. Then we have to plant it then we have to maintain it. I call that the perspiration part. Uh, we have to do the harvesting and the sales. That's the production part. And the assessment, which is the projections part. So those six P's come into every gardening cycle. And you need to review that at least once a year to make sure that you're doing what you wanted to accomplish. So are you meeting the purpose? And how successful were you at meeting the purposes? If you can't meet the purpose, then maybe change purposes. Okay, so uh, the whole idea is to learn every year. Well, are you going to have a garden? What is its purpose? Is it going to be a family garden? Is it going to be a backyard garden for your neighbors? Is it going to be a given garden? Or is it going to be a commercial enterprise? So I've just put down some approximate number of plants that would probably make that work out for you. So if it's a personal device, personal uh, use, I would suggest 10 to 20 plants. If it's a share with your neighbors, I would say 30 to 50 plants. If it's a giving garden, as is Church of the City, I would suggest 75 to 200 plants. If it's a commercial enterprise, I would suggest at least 300 plants. Knowing that a commercial enterprise of 300 plants is going to take us at least a quarter to three tenths of an acre. Okay, so whatever you want to do, what's your purpose? Okay, so there's an example of how many plants you might want to try that first year. Uh, just as a caveat, uh, cultivate yield last year, 2022, was five to seven pints per plant. Well, in preparation, some things you need to know. We've got to know some definitions. So here are the definitions that you need to know. Sometimes you'll hear a blackberry referred to as a Brambleberry. Sometimes you will re hear it referred to as a caneberry. All three words are interchangeable. You have the crown and the canes. The crown is at the top of the ground. The canes are above the ground. Also called the canopy. So anything above the ground is called the canopy. It's a two-year life cycle. You have a primocane, which is the vegetative, and the floricane, which is the reproductive. Two-year cycle. You have three different types. You have the trailing, you have the semi-erect, and the erect. The plants at Cultivate are erect. You have thorn or thornless. I would for sure recommend thornless. You have primocane or floricane. So we're going to address this a little later, but there's two different types. They always have a two-year cycle, but some are called floricanes, Others are called primocanes. We have the budding, flowering, 
and the fruit set. And it's important to know the budding stage, the flowering stage, and the fruit set. Druplets. Druplets are individual fruits. They're the little round things that all combine together to be the blackberry. So when you see a duplet or a druplet that is not black and is not shiny and is not full, it's not going to taste very well. It's going to be bitter. So anytime you have a red druplet, don't eat it because you, the whole thing will be bitter. So you want all the druplets to ripen up. Okay, two wonderful smiling fellows, and we're going to make three examples out of this picture. So I want you to stare just for a moment at the beautiful smiles of these two harvest specialists. We don't call them berry pickers, they're harvest specialists. Okay, the older guy on the left is the floricane. <laughs> he is the berry producing one, so he's older. The guy on your right is the younger guy, he's the vegetative producing. Okay, so a flora cane is the second year cane, it produces berries. The prima cane is the first year cane and it just produces vegetation. Okay, now don't smile, don't stare at their smiling faces, stare at the blackberry in the hand of the younger fella. Along comes the University of Arkansas about 20 years ago. They selectively developed and created a cultivar of blackberries that is called a primocane. And I put an asterisk beside that so that will, when I say primocane and floricane, I'm talking something different than a primocane with an asterisk, okay? The primocane with the asterisk is a new cultivar. Now staring at the blackberry in the young gentleman's hand, which of the two gentlemen is the floricane? The older guy. The younger guy is the primocane. The primocane is the vegetative producing. The old guy is the floricane, the berry producing. But now the young man has a berry in his hand. So for the first time, 2004, the University of Arkansas produced a plant which in the same year produced two sets of fruit. The floricane normally produced fruit and that same year, the primocane produced fruit. So for the first time, the young guy finally gets part of the action. He gets to be the berry producing as well. Okay, so anytime you hear the word primocane star from me, that means it's producing twice a year. And this happens every year. Now the third thing I want you to take from that picture is the purple finger, purple, purple finger syndrome. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Blackberries are native to North America, hence they can overwinter. I've said that blackberries have a two-year cycle, floricanes and primocanes. But the entire crown can last eight to 12 years. So it's a two-year cycle, but it can happen five or six times. Okay, so one crown will generally last eight to 12 years. Soil type, you want sandy or loamy soils with a pH from 6 to 6.8. Get a soil sample, check to see what nutrients are there and what nutrients you need to add. Water drainage, water, uh, blackberries do not like wet feet. So do not plant blackberries in a area that holds water. Okay, a wet, damp soil will not work. Sunlight, direct sunlight is best, preferred, but if you have, say, moderate shade, it's okay but you would like to have sunlight eight hours a day. Do not plant your blackberries in a wild blackberry area. So if you're going to create a blackberry plot next to a field of wild blackberries, don't do that because that will in cause insects and pests and disease perhaps in your plants. Plant orientation, row orientation. If you had a choice, make the rows north-south. You'll have a greater uh, even display of sunlight. Organic matter or mulch is always nice. It helps aeration and helps uh, keep the soil a little more moist. In preparing and preparation, you need to plan what kind of cultivar do I want? So what type of blackberry do I want to select? So you can do single or multi-cultivars depending on the growing zone. 
Tennessee has a growing zone of 7A and 7B. You might want to pick cultivars that overlap a particular time period. So as indicated there, here's a cultivar that would go from July to September. Here's one that goes from middle of August to the end of September. So in that case, you can widen your sales window by picking different cultivars. Thorn or thornless, again, I would absolutely suggest a thornless variety. You can do floricanes or the primacane stars. Uh, the time of the fruiting season depends on which cultivar you get. So again, if you select the right number of cultivars, it's even possible to go from the middle of June to the end of October and have blackberries essentially all summer long. Fruit size and flavor is again a function of the cultivar. Hardiness or shelf life is a function of the cultivar. We have two primary cultivars down at Cultivate. One of those is the Primark Freedom. It's a larger berry and the Primark Traveler. It's a smaller berry. The difference between the two is a size, but more importantly, as the name implies, Traveler has a longer shelf life. So uh, we can put it on the shelf and it will stay in the cooler longer. The cost, uh, would you want to buy from a reputable vendor? You can either do something called a bare root or a seedling, we'll talk about in just a moment. And beware the order by time. If you're planning on berries for the spring of the next year, you have to order them the fall of the previous year. So don't go to your vendor in March and say, I want blackberries for March of this year. The answer is, we don't have any. So you have to put your order in now uh, about four months in advance, and then they'll ship to you in March. So it has to be, you've got to think about it the fall of the, uh, of the year before you want to plant. And then know you're not going to get berries that first year. You're going to get berries the next year, okay? No berries the first year. Now, up to planting. So here's a suggestion of the row design, particularly how far apart are the plants to be and how far apart are the rows. So depending on whether you have a habitus type of trailing, erect, or semi-erect, you would pick between four and six feet between plants. Ours are the erect plants, so our chosen distance between plants is four feet. So if you go down to cultivate, our primary crowns are set four feet apart. The rows are established at 12 feet apart. So from row to row is 12 width, 12 feet width. And that is to allow you pick, to allow mechanical, you know, mowers and, and tractors through there so you can, without running over your things. Uh, depending on whether you buy a seedling or a seed or a plant or a large pot, obviously your whole preparation will be different. But for sure, dig a much larger area than is necessary. Dig deeper than necessary. Put your plant or your bare root in place. Pack it down so that there's no air, so that the roots get contact with the soil. And plant either the seedling or the bare root right to the, to the surface of the crown. Okay? No deeper than that, no shallower than that. Here are examples of the bare root and of a plug. A bare root is cheaper, but I have found to be not as viable. So you're going to lose some plants if you select to, to plant out your field with bare roots. The plugs are a little more expensive, maybe two or three dollars more expensive each, but it's well worth it because I found out you're going to get probably 95 to 99 percent survival rate. Uh, a bare root may be three to six bucks a piece. The plug may be four to eight dollars a piece. And you can get the gallon size. If you're going to do a back porch garden, then you might do four or five plants with a big gallon size. Suggested vendors are Johnny Seeds, Stark Brothers Orchard, Norse Farms, and Indiana Berry Company. Trellising. Trellising is necessary to keep the vines off the ground to keep the berries off the ground, to aid in circulation and sunshine penetration, to aid in removing of the floricanes. So trellising is a very important thing. I would suggest trellising at or near the time of planting your berries. 
Now you're not going to need the trellising until the fall of that first year, but for sure go ahead and get it done, get it out of the way, have your trellising up. You don't want to have one year old berries, one year old canes, and then try to put your trellis up. Not going to be very pleasant. Uh, a couple examples of trellising. Here's the T trellis, just a vertical post with horizontal uh, post on the side, which allows to get the separation of the wires. Here's a very sophisticated trellis called a rotating cross arm. It has a couple advantages. Uh, it can be turned over as here, and if you do it at the correct time, you can have all the flowers and all the blooms be on one side. Turn it up, and what you've got, all you just have to harvest on one side. That's kind of clever. The second advantage is in the wintertime in the northern zones, uh, berries could get frostbit or frozen. So therefore, if you turn that to the ground, you could cover up with hay or straw and, and be able to perhaps overwinter better. So it's a great idea in harvesting. It's a great idea if you're in the northern zones for helping uh, keep your plants alive. But quite frankly, it's expensive and difficult to, to get the, the berries and the canes onto that wire. Okay. I have seen it in real time. Uh, it is possible, but uh, the folks that did it says, yeah, it, it is a hassle. Uh, here's the third, the V-trellis. Nothing new about the V-trellis. Uh, it just allows you to now, instead of having only one or two vertical, you can move that vertical up and down as you want to. So it allows for the changing of the, uh, of the vigor or the growth of the canes. So as the cane grows, you might move the, the lines up and down on your, uh, on your stakes, on your post. And uh, it's something that you could put on the back of a tractor. Uh, it's a three-point hitch. <coughs> A little bit more about that. These are metal T-posts, either seven feet or eight feet. Ours are seven feet. Uh, the posts are located 20 feet apart. So we now have five blackberries, four feet apart. So within plus or minus one half blackberry, there will be a post. Okay, every, every fifth blackberry, there will be a post. So for sure, it's 20 feet apart with a seven foot T-post. It's just standard uh, electrical fence conductors. Uh, the yellow conductor here, just hold the wire up. It's uh, 17 gauge galvanized wire. I use tomato, um, uh, what are those things called? <laughs> yeah, tomato clips, thanks, uh, to hold the, the wire in place. Easy installation, and it's totally changeable. So if you want to to change out something, you can do it very quickly. So it's, it's not you have to take a, a post down and take the, take the horizontal beams down. It, it can be done quite quickly. The approximate cost in $2,022 is $1.50 a linear foot. So if you know how long your rows are and you know how many rows you have, the total linear feet, I can tell you right now, the cost of the T-post, the wire, the insulators will be about $1.50 per foot. Much cheaper than the other methods. And if you uh, want to use the, the V-trellis idea for something else, here's an example of pest coverage. So if you had, for instance, blueberry patch, birds will eat blueberries to death. So you've got to cover up your blueberries. Well, here's a nice way of covering up your blueberries is by having this V-trellis and putting a wire netting on top. Uh, if you wanted to uh, temporarily get row covering to support extended growth periods, you could make that and, and put a cover across it and now you've got maybe another two or three months or two or three weeks in the early spring or in the late fall to extend your growing season. And uh, if you were like Abby and, and wanted to cut flowers, you can support your cut flower uh, supports with that. Fertilizer. Um, one half cup of fertilizer suggested 10, 10, 10, 30 to 60 days following the planting of the seedlings. Don't fertilize when you plant. They're afraid that you may put fertilizer on it and you will kill, kill the blackberries. Okay, so wait 30 to 60 days before you do your, verse, your first uh, fertilizing. 
Then yearly, you want to do a half a cup to a cup per plant at bloom break. So if you have the regular floricane berries, they will bloom around late May. At bloom break, you want to put a half a cup to a cup surrounding, say, plus or minus six inches diameter around the, each individual plant. Now, if you have the primocane star, you've got two bloom breaks. So now just have the one half to one cup and do a quarter cup to a half cup every bloom break. So you've got the floricane bloom, bloom break again in May. So you'll do your quarter cup to a half a cup around each plant. Then you will have your primocane bloom break somewhere around late July. Do it again. So in each case for the primocane primes or primocane stars, you are fertilizing at the time of bloom break. Irrigation. During the growing season and particularly the, the, the budding bloom break and the fruiting stage, you want one or two inches of rainfall throughout that season. If you don't get that, then you need water. So this year, Tennessee, we wouldn't need water. But in most years, have water available. So drip irrigation is much preferred to the spray irrigation methods. Avoid overwatering. And instead of using white or black plastic, use mulch or the permeable landscape mat. Weed control. Here's a pretty, as in pretty, example of the width of the mulch. I didn't mention that a few months ago, but it's generally between two and five, uh, four and five feet. So two to two and a half feet on each side of the bush, you, you've got a row of mulch. You want that mulch to, uh, to be weed free. In this case for the U-Pick, we have a nice grassy spot between the two rows. So you want to keep that well manicured. So you guys on the lawnmower, you ladies on the lawnmower, when you mow through there, do not allow the exhaust to go into the mulch. You're just weeding and weed seeding all of the mulch again, okay? So keep the, uh, keep the exhaust from the lawnmower not into the mulch. You'll keep hearing me say setting the edge. So the most difficult part in keeping this weed free is making sure that that edge between the grassy part and your mulch is free of grass or, and or weeds. So set that edge maybe every three or four weeks and keep it from growing underneath the mulch from the grass to the mulch. Generally, it's not the, the weeds and the mulch that's the problem. It's the grass that grows from the grassy part into the mulch. If you have the landscape mat, which is an example here, uh, just know you've got the same edging problem and know that too, in that hole, in that landscape mat, you're going to have weeds that come up right against the canes and the crown. If you fail to do that, it will not be pretty. Now let's talk about pruning. Pruning, I think, is the most important job in maintenance of blackberries. If you prune well, your yields are better. If you prune poorly, your yields will decrease and your harvesting labor will go up. Tip, which means cut off the top, we'll have an example in just a moment. Tip the first of your canes when they reach three to five feet in the summer. So the first of your canes will grow like beginning around the end of April and grow through May and June. Okay, so that's what we're going to tip here in a few minutes. Laterals are what grows off the primary cane. So this would be a lateral, that would be a lateral. We're going to tip those back to 12 to 18 inches in late fall. After the flora cane has produced the berry, cut it out. Cut it out as soon as it fruits or when the when the fruiting season is over, so let's say the 1st of July, there's no more berries on the floricanes. Cut the floricanes back to the ground. It's dying. It may have a few berries still left or a few flowers still left on it, but it's dying. It's done its thing. And the rest of the primocanes are good and green. So don't cut the green ones. 
cut the ones that you know have buried. Buried, okay? B-E-R-R-I-E-D, buried. Okay? Uh, you always need to know what's a year one cane, what's a year two cane. So when you go to your blackberry patch, it's very obvious to you all the time, you can tell the age of that particular cane. It's either a floricane or a primocane, okay? You need to know to tell that difference all the time. I got a question, George. Yeah. <laughs> but there where it says to cut 12 to 18 inches yeah. now, are you talking about from the main cane or from the end of your lateral back? Okay. I th my understanding is I want 12 to 18 inches from the main cane. Essentially, the longer the lateral is, and for that matter, the longer the primary is, you've just got growth that's doing nothing because you're only going to get berry at the very end. So you have too much growth for, for no return. So cut that off and, and limit the amount of uh, unnecessary length. Uh, at the time of the primocane pruning, which is now the end of the season, cut out any weak or diseased canes and leave preferably four to six viable canes in each crown. So right now, if you go down to the, the 320 plant plot, you will find in every cane hill, you will find easily six to 12 canes. So we will cut out the ones that are diseased, cut out the ones that are weak, cut out the smaller ones, and we'll leave generally somewhere between four to six canes per crown. All right. Now, that's, let's talk about primocane star. Okay, a little difference because you're going to have to prune twice now. Okay, so you've got the primocane star. Let's talk about tipping. Tipping is what you want to do to the primocanes as they begin to grow and turn green, new growth in the spring. The end of each branch is called the terminus. The terminus has three parts to it. If you look very closely here, here's a part, here's a part, and in the very middle you see something I just clipped off. So I took a small pair of scissors or just my, my fingers and snipped out that middle branch of the terminus vine. Okay, so I took out the middle. It's called tipping. Now, if I move that further down the branch, say two or three, four inches from the very end, we call that a hard tipping versus soft tipping. So preferred would be to do soft tipping of your primocanes each spring. Now, don't go through once and think you're done. Those primocanes are at different sizes every time you go out there. So you'll have some that are maybe 10 inches tall, some are 20 inches tall, some are 40 inches tall. You want to tip as necessary. So when you see a terminus that is, has those three parts, you want to tip that off. And you may go through there two or three times in the spring to do that. Tipping is going to create more yield. If you only have berries at the end of the cane, you've got one set of berries. But if you now remove the end of the cane and have a lateral this way and a lateral this way, you've increased your yield. So tipping is very directly proportional to the amount of yield you're going to get. Here's an example of pruning near the base. So. Uh, this is what it looks like out there right now. And you're going to, you have five or six, ten canes per crown. You're going to look at any suckers coming off the canes near the bottom, near the ground. And you're going to remove that sucker as indicated here. Cut that sucker out. You want to cut off the lateral, not the primary. As you move up the primary, there may be secondary suckers or laterals now, they suggest you prune those off between 18 and 24 inches above the ground. So our wires, our bottom wire is set somewhere around 20, 25 inches. So essentially if, if that particular 
lateral is below the wire, we'll go ahead and cut it off. Okay, if it's above the wire, we'll leave it. Okay, so that's at the base. So you're going to, re, uh, you're going to remove the, anything that's diseased, anything that's small, and anything that has a sucker on it, leaving hopefully four to six canes per crown. Now at the same time, we're going to do the laterals. Okay, so that was the, the primary canes. Now we're going to do the laterals. The picture is not quite as good, but here's an example that uh, Scott took for me uh, last week. If you, you see the, the primaries coming up, but if you look very closely, you will see laterals four and five feet long off the primary canes. Okay, you don't want that going into winter. So we will cut those off to, again, about 12 to 18 inches uh, from the, the, the primary. Okay, so what we started with then is something that we've solved the base. Now we're looking at the laterals, so it's got a lot of laterals. So we will cut that off, and now if you look very closely, what you have, had seen before, the laterals are much shorter. An example of nothing pruned on the left to now total pruning on the right. So this is yet to be pruned. This is a line of, of pruned. A lot, a lot of canes are going to be trash. Do not leave the canes in the pathway, get them up, take them to the compost pile. So when we started pruning the primacanes, either primacanes or primacane star, it doesn't matter, this fall we did three things. We set the edge again, we weeded the mulch and set the edge between the mulch and grass barrier. Most of what happens in the fall looks like this. You've got length, you've got vines growing everywhere. They may be 20 feet in length. They're all generally off the trellis. They're just laying everywhere due to the summer. So now you've got to trim the base, trim the length, trim the laterals, and attach them to the trellis. Uh, as an approximation, it would take about 10 man hours to do one single row of our blackberries. The rows are 160 feet, okay? 10 man hours to get the grass out. Another nearly 10 man hours to get the pruning. So you're looking at a 20 man hour per row to do setting the edge getting the grass out, pruning, and putting them, attaching them to the trellis. So again, the, the greatest labor is required in pruning. Okay, and that did not include the pruning of the floricanes that happened after the first harvest. Okay, we went in and just snapped off the floricanes at the base. Good news, bad news. Trellis is a great idea. If you don't optimize the trellis, then you've got problems. So here's a really bad example of a trellis that didn't do its job. In the middle you will see nice green vertical growth which is the primacanes or primacane stars that happened every season. To the lateral is last year's plants that are now going to fruit. Well what happened was they came off the trellis, they got really big and they just kind of fell over. So if you don't have your canes attached to the trellis, they're going to fall over and you get ready to harvest. This is what it looks like. Uh, disease and pest control. Both years, 2022, 20, 2023, we did not have pest nor disease, so we didn't use any herbicides, any pesticides, or anything to, to reduce disease. If you have a diseased plant, you need to identify that, and there are are a ton of references to do that. Every year, this group called the Southeast Regional Caneberry Group, a group of scientists comes together and writes the latest and greatest on all the pest, all the fungi, everything that could possibly be wrong with your blackberries, and they put it into a book, which is free. It's on the, on the web, you just download it. So every year, Southeast Caneberry Group will have last year's uh, right now in 2024, you'll be able to get 2023's Caneberry book. <clears throat> For the Primacane stars, we're going to do
do one more time. This is what is required of the maintenance. In the spring, you want to weed. You want to do your trellis management, your tipping, your first round of fertilizer, and disease pest watch. As you enter summer, you begin the first harvest, harvest number one. As soon as that harvest is over, cut the floricanes out. Continue to tip the primicanes as they're growing. As they bloom break, as the primicanes bloom break, fertilize them. So that's the second fertilization. Continue your weeding and your disease and pest watch. In the fall, you've got harvest number two. After harvest number two, prune your primicanes. Manage your trellis, do your weeding, your pest and plant control, uh, and disease watch. In the winter, okay, so now, check on your trellis, make sure it's upright, all the vines are attached. Your mulch management, and we need mulch. So uh, if we can possibly get some mulch, that would be a great thing, or uh, whatever we're gonna do, we need some mulch. Irrigation system checks, so occasionally we will put a hole in, heaven forbid, we put a hole in the, in the drip tape, but occasionally it happens. Um, we will, none of us would do that, of course. Yield review and projections for next year and sales review and projections. Now let's talk about harvesting and sales. Um, use gap procedures, so wash hands, keep your vessels clean, do not allow a blackberry to hit the ground. So the last time Gap came here, I was out in the blackberry field doing something, I think weeding, and Jimmy brought this guy out to look around and the Gap inspector looked at me and his question, I only have one question for you, sir. He didn't know who I was or what I was doing. He didn't know if I was a cultivator or volunteer or whoever. What are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm weeding, I'm pruning. Uh, I have one question. That question is, if a blackberry fell on the ground, what are you going to do with it? So I told him, you're going to leave it there. Do not pick it up. And that's all he wanted to know. Okay, so do not allow a berry that's on the ground to go into your sales berries. Here's what I suggest. You get the plastic clamshell. You put that in your hand. You pick the berries off the plant with clean hands. You put the berries off the plant, put them in the clamshell. Don't overfill it. Close the clamshell and do not allow it to get on the ground. So have a runner with a bucket or with a basket come around and pick up all the different clamshells as you're picking. What that does is you now don't have to put the berries from one container to another container to another container. So you've got handling only one time. You've kept it off the ground so there's free of dirt, free of, of whatever, right? And they're stackable for ease of handling. Do not allow more than 30 minutes, preferable, preferably, from the time of harvest to the time it gets into the first refrigeration. When it goes to the last refrigeration, that should be somewhere around 40, 45 degrees. Harvest in the cooler hours of the day. If your rows are oriented east-west, and hours are oriented east-west, it makes a lot of sense that you would pick the east side in the early morning, and then later, whenever you still have some time left before noon in the one o'clock sun, go to the west side, which is now a little cooler. Okay, so instead of picking one whole row at eight o'clock in the morning, why don't you just pick the east side of that row on two rows and then come back later and pick the, the west side. The darker, fuller, and more glistening, the droplet, greater will be the sweetness of that berry. So the more full it is, the more black it is, greater will be the sweet, okay? Any dropped or decayed berries that are on the ground, you have a choice. You're not gonna sell them, you're not gonna eat them, so at least clean them up to keep the pest away. 
what we found out will birds will be in there all the time. So you'll see birds flying into the bottom because they're eating the berries that are on the ground. So if, if you want to go to the extra effort of keeping the berries up off the ground, then uh, somehow remove the berries uh, at the conclusion of harvesting each day. Uh, otherwise, just let the berries fall on the ground and don't touch them again. Question on that. Yeah. Um, by having the berries there, are the birds going to be less prone to eat the berries that are in the That's a real good question. Uh, I don't think we've had any bird issues with eating the berries uh, to date, so maybe that's a, a good way to resolve it. Okay, keep them on the ground where they belong. Uh, here's two graphs of the two different type of berries we have. We have the Arkansas Freedom, so it's just a plot of the number of pints that we harvested over a 20-day period. Here's an example of the Primark Travelers, which we harvested over a 33-day period, and just the amount of pints per day. So it just shows you that uh, typically you want to harvest at least every second day. If you conclude on Friday, well, you know, I'm, I'm too tired or it's raining, so I'll just wait till Monday to harvest. What is going to happen is that the berries from Friday to Monday are now decayed and you've lost that yield. Okay, so I think you should do every two days. If that happens to be a Saturday or a weekend, the answer is go out there and if you're working, considering yield, you got to get the most yield by being there every second day. Here's a great fellow uh, who did not get the memo about the uh, plastic. He, he used the corrugated blue ones, but that's all right. Um, this particular fellow was worried, was more concerned about money. So here's the money side of things. For our 320 blackberry plants, they cost us $7 a plug. The 1,280 total linear feet cost almost $2,000 for all the trellising materials. If you received an extrapolated sales of $6 a pint, or in this case $5 a pint, the 672 total pints in 2022 off the Prime Art Travelers yielded us conceivably $8,360. Now, assuming that you hired your labor and you paid them $15 an hour, if you tick, pick 10 pints an hour, it's going to take 167 hours of labor. So $2,500 labor cost estimate. In that first year, you made a net profit of $1,670. So you paid for your berries, you paid for your trellising, you paid for your labor, and you still made a little money that first year. Now the caveat is that was not your irrigation, that was no fertilizer, that was no mulch. Okay, So with 320 berries, somewhere around three-tenths of an acre, the yield is somewhere around $8,000 if you have a market. If you have a market. Uh, a, a quick point here is now if we took those two graphs and we put them together, so we have two different types of berries and we just plotted the pints per day versus the number of days. You will see that there are about four separate days that we had more than 150 pints to pick per day. Well, if you've got a limited labor force, you can't pick the berries that day. So the idea would be, oh, that might be a really clever time to have a you pick scheduled or to maybe have something called, a, what I call a charity event scheduled. So you would pick those days whereby in your harvest, you knew that was going to be your most difficult labor days and let someone else do the labor for you. Here's an example of bad example. How many kids do you see standing up? I count about five. Yeah. How many do you see bending over? I count about five. So you've got 10 volunteers out here harvesting your blackberries. Five of them are standing up, five of them are on the ground. Why is that? Because you allowed your berries to fall off the trellis and now all the weight is on the ground and they're having to bend over. Okay, that is going to re re increase your labor and it's going to reduce your yield because they're not going to go through there and, and, and try to get those berries on the inside. 
All right, so poor trellising will yield increased labor and poor yields. Now, the you pick and the charitable thing. So now imagine those four days that you're going to have 150 pints per day projected. You don't have enough labor. So now that would be a good time to schedule your you pick or to schedule what I call a, a uh, charity event. So let's suggest or say you had a Boy Scout troop or a Girl Scout troop and they wanted to have a fundraiser. So you as the owner say, okay, I will give your troop a dollar for every pint you harvest today. Well, at the end of the day, they harvested 100 pints. 100 pints times a dollar is $100. So you give the charity $100. How much are you going to sell those for? Five dollars. So five dollars minus one dollar is four dollars times you just made four hundred dollars profit and it didn't cost you any labor. Yeah. So so the answer is that's a clever idea to help reduce your labor cost. So either you pick them at a reduced price or you have a charity event come in and pick them for you. 2022, the June yield of our Primacane stars was 1,672 pints. So that was the very first year we, in the very first harvest we had, 1672. The mid-September, the fall second harvest, yielded only 67 pints. This was our first year. We didn't understand. We didn't know why. But for sure, we know that it frosted heavy early last year. So we had berries blooming, or we had flowers blooming. We had red berries ripening and it frosts. So the second it frosts, the blooms are gone, the buds are gone, the red is gone, the black is gone, your harvest is over suddenly when it frosts. So we had an early frost about two weeks earlier than this year. So we lost, we lost X number of pints just due to the early frost. Now, 2023, due to something we'll talk about in just a few minutes, the yields went really down. Uh, approximately 150 pints in the spring. Compared to 1672, that's really a big drop. Went up in September to October because now about 650 pints. So it nearly 10 times what it was last, okay? And we're gonna see here in just a moment, it's very, very seasonally dependent and you may not be able to predict exactly what your yield is gonna be every time. So just know that we were pleased in 2022, we were less than pleased in 2023, and I think it was nothing to do with us, it had to do with the weather. So some things we learned in 2022. The importance of trellising and pruning. Labor requirements, we had no idea what it was gonna cost, the number of man hours we spent with the cultivators harvesting our berries in 2022. The purple finger syndrome. Remember the guy, the smiley guy with the purple fingers? Okay, if your fingers are purple as you're picking the berries, you were picking berries that should have been picked one or two days earlier. So the berry has matured too much. That's still edible, and it still may be able to go in, into your container. But if you'd have picked it yesterday or the day before, you would have had a nice firm berry. So if that continues to happen and you got purple finger syndrome, you need to be harvesting more frequently. Single versus multi cultivar. So we figured out you probably want to spread out your choice of blackberries. Don't have just one kind, have a number of kinds. So in our case, we have two different primacane stars. We have the Arkansas Freedom, we have the Arkansas Traveler. 2022 and 2023, there was a minimal, if any, pest or disease. So maybe we've been fortunate. Maybe it's because we take an effort to, to keep our, 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 our plants healthy. But regardless of what the issue was, we had no disease nor pest those two years. And we found out that uh, if you have 1,672 pints off of one crop, that could produce you a positive yield. So it's a small income boost uh, to the organization. Now the lessons learned in 2023. 
Production is very seasonally dependent. Unusual temperature change. This didn't occur in spring of 2023. It occurred in winter of 2022. If you remember in December, somewhere around the 15th or 20, before Christmas, right before Christmas, the temperature went from about 50 degrees, maybe 40 degrees, to nearly 10 degrees in a 12-hour interval. So it was not only the 10 degree temperature, but more importantly, it was that very rapid decrease. So the, in my opinion, the plant did not have time to acclimate. Okay, so you go from okay to very cold, but it happened quickly. It would have been better if we'd have had a 40 degree night, a 30 degree night, a 20 degree night, a 10 degree night would have at least a little bit of acclimation, but we had it from 40 to 10 almost overnight. And now the winter of the spring or winter spring of 2023 was unusually wet and unusually cool. Okay, we can't change what happened in December. We can't change how the spring happened in 2023. But as a result of that, this is what we think happened. There was stress caused by the large temperature variation change. There was stress induced by the cool weather and a stress due to the wet weather. You've got the, the beautiful primocanes now flowering, budding, flowering, and fruiting. It looked wonderful down here about uh, the middle of May. Things looked really, really good. They began to almost turn black, and suddenly the plant dies. Mm. The, the, the cane. The cane began to die, so the fruit died. Jimmy was very concerned that we had a disease. I think instead of a disease, it was the fact that my brother's the ag guy, says if you stress and stress and stress and stress a plant, the greatest stress is when it's beginning to fruit. So the last fruiting stress is ripening to put the sugars in place. Now you've had all this stress that happened from the weather and it didn't express itself until it was ready to, to eat and then it suddenly died. So that hopefully is what created our very much smaller yield this spring. Okay, so the weather in the fall of last year and the weather in the early spring changed our yields for that first harvest. Now, as a result of things being better or the weather improving, getting hot, then we had a much improved second harvest. Fruit ripening or taste is weather dependent. Even the fruit that did ripen in the spring tasted not very good. Okay, so again, the weather was a function of what that final changing of the, the fructose or whatever it is to make it sweet. Something happened with that weather which made the berry not taste very good. Pruning techniques. If you want to manage differently, you prune differently. Okay, some farmers will elect, even with a primocane star, they can do one of three things. You can have two seasons, like we are presently doing, or you can have a summer season and a fall season. So pick your choice. I want just berries in the fall. I just want berries in the summer. Or I want berries in the fall and summer. You would prune according to what your goals are. So far, we thinking that the most optimal yield and to spread our season out, it's better to have both crops, both seasons, okay? So we prune, so we have two harvests per year. Pruning is indicative of the production numbers. If you don't prune as well and get those laterals cut off and do the tipping, the answer is you're gonna have less yield. Okay, so pruning is the essence of blackberry yields. Replacement, it's suggested that since the, this blackberry crown is going to last from eight to 12 years, that maybe after a couple of years, in our case, 
the, the Primark uh, Freedoms are about six years old. So if you look at those, they're beginning to, the, the crowns are beginning to die, some of them. So you begin to replace your, your uh, crowns, they say somewhere around 10% a year. So go through and look where you have a gap and, and put in a new, a new cane, or I'm sorry, put in a new uh, seedling. The caveat that I found out this year, you only know things by experience. What I found out this year was when you got me the plants, it was later in the spring. So instead of it being March when we planted your blackberries down at Church of the City, it was more like June, uh, more like April, early May. So what I did unknowingly, I dug a little hole and I put it in between two canes. What was already growing when I did that? The new prima canes were already up 18 inches, two feet tall. I now put a little small plant in there among all that shade and among all that warning water, warning sunshine, and what happened? I just found out. I have seen of the 60 I put in the ground, it was something like uh, I've seen five or six that are alive. Okay, uh, so do not wait until June to begin to supplement your extra plants. Do it as soon as the primocanes begin to grow, okay? So they'll grow up together. To address your question of, do you always want primocane stars? And the answer is, that's up to you. That's up to how you're going to, to decide on your crop. So if you don't worry about a second harvest, don't buy a primocane star. So down at Church of the City, we elected not to have the extra pruning and the extra maintenance for primocane stars, we just bought regular floricanes. And we bought uh, 140 what's called pancas and 60 kados. So they will be up and ready uh, 2024 and there will be only floricane producing, so there will be one harvest per year. Uh, plans for a berry processing kitchen, so we'll talk about that in just a second. So that's coming up in 2024 as a new kitchen comes online. And something called a new uh, planting technique I call minimum till. So now you've got blackberries, for example, this year that didn't taste well. So you had reduced number of berries, but they didn't taste very good. So you, you eat them raw, they're not very appealing. But if you could somehow freeze those, add sugar to them, or put them in jams and jellies and pies and desserts, then you could sugar them up and, and make them good. So if you had a commercial kitchen, and obeying all the regulations that apply, uh, we this year, or Adam this year in 2024 is beginning to, to, he says every berry we pick, we're going to use. And then lastly, what we tried at Church of the City Instead of having a plot of ground for which we had it all cultivated and then made rows 12 feet apart, put in our plants, established the trellising, now we had a nice piece of land that already had grass on it. So why don't we just use the grass that's there? So we did a new idea. We just plowed two plow widths to make the, the furrow, to make where the plant is going to go. We left where the sod was and did one 12 feet apart and did that again and essentially we planted into basically grassy ground and we now have a nice bulk of grass and we have a nice plant width of mulch. So uh, instead of having to wait for grass to grow for a year we had automatic grass. Uh, this would be a, a Nike uh, goodbye would be just don't stand there looking at your feet uh, go ahead and order some blackberries and uh, it will be at, at best a learning experience, hopefully a rewarding experience, okay? So I've enjoyed blackberries more than I can possibly tell you. Um, it's, it's more fun to me to do blackberries than any other thing I've ever grown. It is so clever how God made those things work. Uh, I, I learn something every time I go down there. So it's a lot of fun to do blackberries and 
If you have a labor force, you can make some dollars if you're a small-time farmer. Okay, just looking for some supplemental income. Yeah. yeah no, I okay, that. I'm done. Can I quit now? Yeah. All right. Uh, it says here, wait for crowd to respond with applause. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>